of her bacon and eggs. We'll share a laugh and a story and even a wish on the breakfast dish. Good morning, friends and family and everything in between. Welcome to the second Oh my god, the 22nd episode of The Breakfast Dish. It's not this, uh, we know what we're doing by now. It's 22. I'll, I'll, I cannot wait to get this intro perfect no matter what and not be impressed by the number. Karen? Yes, Griffin? You go. What were you going to say? I was going to say, good morning, friends and family and everyone in between. Welcome to the 22nd episode of The Breakfast Dish, a podcast started by you and me, my mother, nope. I'm the mother. You're the son. (laughs) My mother. I'll pick it up. This is an improv game. My mother based it off of a Facebook photo series. um, Called the Breakfast Series that was on Facebook where I would take pictures of people I had breakfast with and talk about them on Facebook so that... This is going to be a nightmare for you to edit so that I could introduce uh, people in the arts community uh, or not in the arts community to introduce them to people either inside or outside those communities, a whole a whole mingling miasma of people to meet. Uh, afterwards. Afterwards, we would I would put oh it on Facebook. <laughs> anyway, uh, Griff, the thing is, when we started Stay Away From Each Other times, all of our theater or a lot, a lot of our theater that we were going to watch live or do live or see live uh, may have moved virtually or may have moved locales, etc. So uh, you and I are trying to talk about amplify, advertise, push forward, promote art that is happening visually or virtually, online or in-person, socially distanted. And this is a big one. Today is a big one. Art that is happening visually? What does that mean? I don't know. Like people can see it? I meant to say virtually. (laughs) I see. Okay. Art that is happening uh, activates two out of your three senses. Art that is happening artfully. And today's a big one because... Uh, the biggest theater in our city, Theater Calgary, with the longest running Christmas show, A Christmas Carol, uh, has found a way to make sure that you and I don't miss the tradition that we have shared for almost every single one of your 24 years. Uh, and our guest today, take it away, Griff. Oh, oh right, the improv <laughs> game. Oh, my God, I wasn't on it. Uh, <laughs> our guest today is none other than Stafford Arima. Stafford, how are you? Hi, friends. How are you? I'm so uh, deeply honored to be here at the breakfast gathering. It's a very special time because it's not often that we get to interview our guest actually at breakfast time. So we appreciate you meeting with us this early. Well, I loved it, actually. I'm, I'm an early riser, and it reminds me, actually, when I was in high school, we had a very small theater club that we called the Breakfast Club, and we actually got together in the mornings prior to classes and just talk all kind of geeky, nerdy things theater. And we actually had <sighs> some uh, like hoodies. And in the old days, I say the old days, Griffin, because you probably wouldn't remember, but your mom and I would remember where you could go to a store and you could get like these little felt things pressed onto the backs of shirts or hoodies. And we created something called the uh, TBC, and it was the Breakfast Club. And we would meet and chat. So. I feel this is a great uh, memory of those days when we would get up early in the morning and talk all good things theater. Yes, I have uh, excellent news for you, Stafford, is you're actually the new host of this podcast. I'm going to step <laughs> back. Uh, you obviously have a longer breakfast lineage than I. This has been great. Thank you for uh, 22 good episodes, everybody. <laughs> the Breakfast Club. That's very funny because we, we or at least I, shortened it to, our, uh, to TBD. So that's something we share in common, Stafford Rima. <laughs> what what do you call those anagrams? A- I think it's acronyms. 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 You anagrams, share... I think, is when is when a word is the same letters are spelled different. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> Karen, I'm with you. <laughs> we need to turn to Griffin for all good things that for smart people, right? 
It's true, though. Honestly, I don't know how many times I end up saying, I'll ask Griffin or Griffin will know. And you know what? It is not because you and I are of a generation where we're not smart enough to know it. It's just that he's been doing it longer because it was invented when he was born. <laughs> That's right. I've been I've been doing these anagrams way longer than any of you <laughs> young bucks. Speaking of doing something a long time, this is A Christmas Carol's 33rd year in a row at Theatre Calgary. Am I right, Stafford? Yes, it's 33 years. It's, um, you know, look, we're talking three decades of A Christmas Carol. And, uh, you know, when COVID hit uh, back in March, the day actually just before my 51st birthday on March 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, you know, the first thing that came into my brain, aside from the deep sadness that we had to cancel our opening of admissions. We were in previews for admissions. You know, Friday was our opening night. We had to cancel that. But I would say a good 45 minutes later, after all of that hoopla, I started to think about A Christmas Carol and I started to think about what we would do if we couldn't do it, if this uh, situation that we were in. And at that time, I don't think we necessarily coined it, uh, at least in my mind, as a pandemic, but what this situation could, in fact, bring to us uh, if we uh, if it continued and as it as we know it did. So I remember very, very specifically on Friday the 13th, thinking about Carol and thinking about the importance of this piece, not just because of its message, but because what it means to Calgary and what it means to uh, the tradition of, of a holiday outgoing uh, experience for families, uh, for theater friends, for the community, and what we uh, as a company were going to do if uh, this uh, situation continued. And so uh, it, it was uh, a long time in figuring out what to do, because obviously from March to November, there's uh, quite a bit of time, but uh, I realized that it was uh, something that could not not happen. I agree. This city, that was a lot of what people asked, especially in the theater community, is this got canceled, this got canceled, this got, what's happening with Christmas Carol? That's what uh, so many people asked. Well, you know, when something is a, uh, a tradition, you know, and whether that might be, you know, I, I know living in New York for a couple of decades and All of my Jewish friends who would, you know, on Christmas Day run to the Chinese restaurant and have Chinese food on Christmas Day. You know, these are these are traditions that uh, families, generations, friends, new friends, you know, really uh, rely on. Uh, We are uh, creatures of habit. And uh, for something like a Christmas carol. You know, we found uh, many people who come to A Christmas Carol in Calgary who have not ever come to any other show at Theatre Calgary, who don't go to the theatre, but uh, they make it, yes, it's quite interesting, you know, they make it a very specific outing, and it's usually with, you know, the kids and the grandparents, and and sometimes the little girls and the little boys dress up in their their Sunday bests and come to the theatre and experience A Christmas Carol, I would presume that it happens probably at the ballet for the Nutcracker. There are wonderful uh, productions of the Nutcracker in many cities, and sometimes people use that as their their kind of holiday tradition show that they experience. So, yes, it's obviously uh, a story that rings very true to a lot of people, whether it's because I've seen the film or I saw the new Jim Carrey film. Uh, But live and in person, I think, holds a very special place in a lot of Calgarians' hearts. Karen, do you remember uh, the very first Christmas Carol you took me to? Do you remember how old I was? I want to say that you were five or six. (laughs) I just watched you leave. You just dived into your mind palace for three seconds. Almost blacked out. (laughs) (laughs) I just dived into my Dumbledore pensive. I think you were five or six. Tony Amy was playing Topper and Old Joe, and he got Topper. us. Topper? I would have assumed Fezziwig. No, at that time, he was Topper and Old Joe. And he gave us some comps, and they were in the front row. 
and we went to pick them up and John Paul Fishbach was there and he didn't have any tickets and he claimed our tickets because he thought I wouldn't mind. <laughs> so I was so scared, but then box office got us two tickets right next to where John Paul stole our tickets. Okay, so Lord knows that, that was me, right? Like, so this, this five-year-old Griffin with his popper hat in hand going, I'd love to see the Christmas show. <laughs> Fate of Calvary, could you please find me two extra tickets? It's Christmas. But it was that show that got you thinking, maybe I want to do that. And then the very first thing you auditioned for was Christmas Carol when Nikki Loach was directing it. And you <laughs> didn't right. get it, Never. but she passed your name on for a film role. And then from there on, it was all uphill to theater film glory. Yeah. Uh, Nikki Loach moving forward with Rhonda. So then I went with Chicks with Sticks, I think it was. Yeah, good memory. Let's talk more about our history and nothing anyway, about yeah, Stafford's. <laughs> enough. I'm done here. I just need to celebrate because as we've covered, this is my last episode. <laughs> I need to find my clever banter with Stafford now that we're going to be working together so much. Um, <laughs> That's right. You do have to find that. Stafford, you have a cast of three in this filmed production of A Christmas Carol. Who's in the cast? We have three amazing actors, uh, all from Calgary. And actually, all of the uh, actors were in last year's production, the 2019 production of A Christmas Carol. Uh, Stephen and Marshall and Jamie, uh, three glorious uh, performers who have come into this very new environment and are playing, you know, over 25 characters. So they're all oh. doubling and tripling and quadrupling. And I don't know, is it quintupling? Is Would that, I might yeah. ask Griffin yeah, if yeah. that's the correct. But yes, yeah, so three uh, wonderful storytellers who are bringing to life Dickens' tale with a brand new abridged adaptation by Jeffrey Simon Brown, who did the adaptation to last year's a Christmas Carol. Uh, so we really wanted to keep it in the family. If we couldn't do the full cast, full kind of Megillah production, how do we maintain the balance of the family that was created last year in some capacity, and most yeah. importantly, in a capacity that was uh, safe? One of my fondest memories of the pandemic, if one can have a fond memory of the pandemic, is actually hearing from you and Theatre Calgary that the full, what did you call it? The full Magali, Magutti, Magilla, the full Magilla production was cancelled. <laughs> the full Magilla Cuddy. Full Magilla Cuddy production was cancelled or was not moving forward this year. And your email to us said the reason we can't go forward is because in order to follow the safety protocols, in order to have a cast of 27 socially distanced and this far apart from each other in a dressing room with all the protocols, it's impossible. We don't have the space to take care of the actors. And that warmed my heart to no end because it, it wasn't about money. It was about taking care of your people. Yeah, I, I mean, thanks for uh, sharing that because it, it's true. It, when all of this happened, again, you know, 45 minutes after we had to cancel admissions and the brain starts to pivot, I think that's what we as artists continually do is we have to pivot you as performers, uh, both of you, Griffin and Karen, you both know that if you're on that stage and something isn't there, a prop isn't there, the, the line that you're being cued on doesn't come in at the right time, you pivot instantly, instantly. And so as I was thinking about the future of Carol, the first thing that really came to mind was that backstage, that wonderful, it's a, a great visual of those the rows of costumes on the gondolas and knowing that, you know, the amount of not just onstage friends, but backstage, that there is probably a team of over 40 plus people working on that production. And my brain goes, how is that even going to be possible, especially with six feet? And then, of course, you know, we look at our dressing room situation and we have sometimes in one dressing room, six to eight people. Yep. So inevitably what I kept thinking about is how can I, how can Theatre Calgary, how can we create safe art? How can we create an environment for everybody, not just the performers, but our backstage crew 
that creates an environment of safety, of wellness, and of care. And unfortunately, with a big show like Carol, it just wasn't possible. I want to jump in on something because uh, you guys actually pivoted pretty quickly even before Christmas Carol with the, with the TC Takeout series. I will get into that. But before we do, I want to go back to something because what you covered when there was only three cast members. Does that mean Stephen Hare, who's played Scrooge for, oh my gosh. Yeah, over two decades he's played Scrooge. So is he also now in this production playing other characters? Yes, Stephen Hare is donning the skins of other characters in A Christmas Carol. So for those of uh, you who have not not seen Stephen in other productions playing other characters, tune in because you're going to be able to see Mr. Hare create uh, a plethora of different characters for this production. And I, uh, you know, not to speak for Stephen, but I think that was really exciting for him. And it was an opportunity uh, to look, uh, to relive the show, uh, to relook at the show in a way that became in rehearsals kind of very meta for him. Because as we know, Scrooge observes a lot of the action as he is Mm -hmm. taken on this journey uh, with these spirits. And now the character that is observing or used to observe a scene is now in the scene. So Scrooge is not merely just watching these uh, other characters uh, come to life and tell part of the story. Now Scrooge slash Stephen Hare goes into those scenes and brings those scenes to life. So that meta kind of like, Oh, now I'm in it. Now I'm playing the character that I'm actually used to only watching. So, and I'm not going to share at least today who he's playing, because I think it might be fun for all of our viewers to kind of tune in and and be surprised uh, about all of the the various uh, characters he's portraying. But uh, it, it really added another level, another dimension to the storytelling because there were only three storytellers to bring these characters to life. And I understand you wanted to keep that secret. You know, a lot has happened today. You just gained a podcast. You look anyway, like was... uh, Marky Mark. <laughs> Is it because of my toque? I don't know. I just, all of a sudden, I just saw Marky Mark. So remember him? <laughs> Or Mark I, I, Wahlberg, I guess, is his name. I'll always know him as Marky Mark. I didn't know that was the same person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing. Is he used to be a rapper and now he's an actor? Oh wow, this is—it's too early for me to put those two people into the same. Um... Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you, you really took that hard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to Christmas Carol. As long as Stephen is playing Tiny Marky Tim Mark. and Mrs. Fezziwig, I'll be really happy. And Marky Mark. <laughs> what I do wonder um, where the idea for uh, a TC Takeout came from, from you and your team. And, and for those of you listening who don't know, TC Takeout is um, a virtual showcase of a whole bunch of different artists kind of around the city and the province and the country, each showing off a little bit, a, a little snippet of their own separate skill or um, uh, sharing a monologue or a song or, or memories of a, of a Theatre Calgary show. Um, so how did that come to be, Stafford? I think in many ways... When the when COVID hit and I knew immediately that all of the artists were going to be uh, sequestered in their homes or their spaces and that our creative or perhaps our creativity bubble was going to get very isolated, I guess the idea of being able to still be creative and to share that creativity became something that was very important to me I think as an artist myself you know I think of myself really as a freelance director that's what I did for the majority of my career this uh, artistic directorship is is a new chapter in my journey Uh, so putting myself in the shoes of the artist and thinking that our uh, spark is getting diminished or our spark is being put into a kind of closet or into a corner, I kept thinking, how can Theatre Calgary create an opportunity to be able to share some 
creative jewels and creative moments and maybe not just everyone singing and maybe not everyone just sharing a monologue but maybe just some uh, memories or as we started to expand some tutorials also it started to make me think about how the work and the friends that I've I've made here in Calgary that their work could be shared globally you know because really when you think about it anything online is not just for a, one city it can be for a province it could be for a country it could be for the world when we did uh, Shakespeare by the Bow Romeo and Juliet we discovered just because you can track this uh, is we had people in China we had people in Greece watching uh, Shakespeare by the Bow, Romeo and Juliet. Because again, if you are a Shakespeare fan, or you're perhaps a Romeo and Juliet fan, and you have some kind of hashtag connection on your Twitter or something, so all of a sudden something pops up, and all you have to do is log in, you can watch anything from anywhere in the world. And I thought, how wonderful now to kind of open that door and just share the talent that exists here in Calgary to everyone in the world and to give uh, an opportunity for that creative spirit to not feel kind of locked in and to be creative and, and not to really have something like, uh, okay, Griffin, if you do it, I want it to be this, please sing this song. Uh, what do you want to do? What do you want to share? Someone wants to um, bring in their their little boy and have a tutorial about baking cookies. Great. Uh, we really didn't put any, you know, stipulations on this except time. We just didn't want them to be too long. But we just wanted people to be able to share a little part of their creative lives. And sometimes that meant singing a song and sometimes that meant... Uh, how to do great drag makeup. So, you know, and, and obviously, Griffin, we didn't know if this was going to be, a, you know, a six week, a four month, a whatever. But uh, I thought, well, let's just keep doing it twice a week. So we've done it twice a week since, you know, April. Uh, we had a couple of hiatuses when we had Shakespeare by the Bow and also uh, with the Christmas Carol. But my thinking is, why not continue this through 2021? Uh, and perhaps beyond that, we're all realizing, I think, in the theater community that um, whether or not, you know, things change or go back to quote unquote normal in a month, in six months, in a year, uh, the connectivity points that we can have with online access uh, makes it uh, that much more uh, tangible for some people who maybe can't come into the theater or there will be people, unfortunately, who might be a little nervous about coming into any gathering space, whether or not there is a vaccine or whether or not they've taken that vaccine. So I think as a, a theater people and theater artists, we have to continue to keep expanding our understanding of how do we reach and make theater accessible. And even though uh, online isn't what we are used to, life is not going to be what we're used to, I think, when we come out of this. Um, so let's all just continue to improvise and pivot and be creative during a time that is in many ways forcing us. And I think, you know, the silver lining in all of this is that all artists are having to expand their creative muscles, to work on their creative muscles in very interesting and very special ways. It really is a, a great series. If you're listening, you haven't checked it out. It's such a wide range of stuff. There are absolutely performances and songs, and whatnot. And you know, as you said, Marshall does a great drag makeup tutorial. I think Emma Brager also teaches you how to make a witch hat, if I remember correctly. Like just really outstanding stuff. Uh, and it's it is interesting because it's it's kind of what we talked to uh, Simon Mallet about when we when we received our support for the breakfast dish is that uh, he's hoping at the Rose Foundation that a lot of companies do keep that digital and online element. And I think some of the points you've raised are really poignant, frankly, in terms of yeah, even though uh, theaters will allow to be open and gather, there will be people who will still be nervous about that, which is absolutely understandable coming from the place that we are right now. 
Um, kind of speaking of like flexing creative muscles, I have to ask from my film nerd side of my life. It looks like you guys had. I think I saw some photos that you had like circle dollies in some of your shots. And that's it's a pretty serious film setup. So I'm wondering if you did you guys engage any like local film companies? Did you have somebody in house? Like, do you want to talk about that part of the team? Yes, actually, I have a bunch of dollies and jibs in my backyard. So we just kind of brought them all into the space. No, I was trying to be funny, but I can't. <laughs> I could not tell if you were joking, and if you were, I, I was going to be either. so. <laughs> I think I'm. It, I, it was. I was a very dry response, so perhaps I can't compete with Griffin and Karen on the the timing and comedy. So, but uh, yes, you did see uh, dollies, uh, and we did have a jib, which is kind of like a large crane um uh, for those. Uh, and you know, for me, even this is all new and exciting. Uh, uh, world for me I have not uh, directed a film before I've done music videos and some commercial spots and little things like that but you know nothing on this level but I, I worked with um, a gentleman when I first came to Calgary uh, named Aaron Bernakovich uh, who has a company here in Calgary called 4k film productions uh, or 4k productions and he was uh, one of the camera operators uh, for a promotional spot that uh, Theatre Calgary did when I first arrived. It was kind of, uh, I think it was called a season of new beginnings or something. Uh, and uh, I had this crazy idea in my head about uh, an empty theater, watching the curtain lift to a ghost lamp, to watching all of the artisans backstage, our crew members, our sound department. There's so much behind the scenes that people don't really know and that there is a team of artists who bring to life theater. So anyway, had this crazy idea and met Aaron on the shoot and we instantly connected. Um, and so when the idea to film A Christmas Carol came to be, it, it was just... Uh, a natural phone call to Aaron and his company and say, uh, would love for you to be a part of this. Uh, we are not just planning to film a pro stage production uh, with, you know, a couple of cameras out in the audience, you know, go and just shoot it. We wanted uh, to create something like a fusion, a, a real fusion of these worlds, the film world and the theater world. We're also not doing a film. We're not going on location. We're not, it's not a true film, but it isn't also a, just a true theater piece where, as I said, we just film the show and then edit it together. So uh, through a, a lot of discussion and a lot of, um, you know, kind of storyboarding, we came up with this amazing concept of how to merge these two worlds together. And so there are a, a lot of film techniques uh, that are being utilized in this uh, production that in conjunction with theater techniques. So again, for me, it was exciting to merge these, these worlds together and find a way to capture it in the most creative and uh, inventive way. I think bringing on Aaron Bernakovich, he's easily one of the best cinematographers in the city. Whenever I hear that Aaron's on a project, I'm like, yeah, so that's going to be quality then. He's a he's that's going to be good. Phenomenal with a camera. I want to know what you've done with your backyard now that there's no dolly tracks in it anymore. To plant a garden. Or... That's true. Yeah, it must feel pretty empty. Yeah. Yes, well, it is quite empty. So now I just have little chickens and some piglets <laughs> running around. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I'll never punish you for laughing. I just love that you said chickens and piglets. Well, yeah, they have to grow. Into, they have to grow from somewhere, Karen. I know. You, you didn't grow up on a farm, did you, Karen? <laughs> just it's the piglet. The word piglet is just anyway. It doesn't matter. All right, we're moving on. Well, my oh, goal yeah. is to make either of you laugh. So at least I made one of you laugh. So <laughs> maybe I'll make Griffin laugh at some point. <laughs> yeah, it'll be hard. I, uh, oh, I was trying to think of the Scrooge line. And all, all I could think of is the Grinch line. My heart shrunk two sizes this day. I think so. It doesn't matter. Anyway, this is not a question that I would normally have the courage to ask, but I got an email from Chris Loach saying that I'm allowed to ask it. So here I am. Uh, I am wondering what Theatre Calgary's plans are for the new year. Me too. Whatever you're comfortable sharing about that. 
And if if Chris was wrong, and I can't ask that, this is <laughs> this is my admission of guilt. Well, actually, Chris was wrong. You're not allowed to ask that. So absolutely, yep, fair bad enough. Bad on everyone. No, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Stafford, here's my podcast. Uh, <laughs> I'll back away. Yeah, no, in all seriousness, uh, you know, we as a theater company have a lot to think about as we move into 2021. And with a brand new uh, executive director that just joined our company uh, on November the 2nd, Maya Cholden, both her and I are really excited about figuring out the future of Theatre Calgary and how we continue to bring art to this community. I think the one of the most important uh, uh, takeaways that uh, the past kind of eight and a half months have, have shown us all is that there is really no consistency in the evolution of how this pandemic and how each city is responding to uh, numbers and or the crises that we're in. And I say that because, you know, if over the eight months we could go, well, it was this number, now it's all gone down and and everyone this and it, you know, but it goes up, it goes down, lockdowns happen and then they're stopping and then all of a sudden everything's good and everyone's out partying and then there's another outbreak. So, you know, because it is such a moving target, I think the important thing that Maya and I are really contemplating is how far out do we go with regards to announcing ideas, seasons, subscriptions, because right now, not to sound pessimistic, but things aren't going in like a positive way, at least for Calgary. And uh, for any of uh, my colleagues in the city who perhaps thought maybe in May, oh, things are looking great and, you know, it's all going to get better, now are having to pull programming because things just can't happen. Uh, you know, today is the 24th of November uh, and there perhaps is going to be some information coming from AHS about uh, Calgary. And in many ways, I feel very blessed and the theater angels were looking down upon the production of A Christmas Carol because we've we've wrapped. We were in the theater and perhaps next week, maybe there might be a bit news that we had to leave the theater uh, because we couldn't be in that space. So I think the I think that's a very long way of answering the question. We are very hopeful to continue to program next year. It's really essential for not not just Theatre Calgary, but for arts organizations, I believe, to continue to create opportunities, uh, not only for the artists, uh, but for the community, uh, the community who can uh, perhaps come and gather again and experience that. Now, is that 10 people? Is that 50 people? Uh, you know, we have at the Maxwell Theatre over 700 seats. I don't believe that next year we will be in a position to have uh, you know, a 700 seat filled house. That's my feeling for 2021. However, the great thing about having a large space, it just means that we can truly social distance people in, you know, if people are slightly uncomfortable with six feet. Well, let's make it 12 feet and, mm -hmm. you know, and create an environment that allows people to even feel more comfortable. Uh, it's a, it's a cavernous space. And, um, with all of that height and width, you know, it feels very different being in that kind of space than it might be if you're in a very small space with someone six feet away from you. So the, the, the short answer is Theatre Calgary is hoping to uh, continue programming next year very uh, uniquely and specifically. That probably means on some level that we can't do shows that have 15, 20 people. Uh, and so the challenge, uh, and it's a creative challenge to find a, uh, a production that uh, is perhaps a one person show or a two person show. And also to find something, um, and I say a brand, meaning a title that is going to uh, entice friends to come to the theater. You know, I have to think to myself that if, if I haven't been in a gathering space for, you know, perhaps a year, and uh, things have slightly um, loosened up and people are feeling comfortable. 
if I'm going to walk into a theater, I want to walk into a theater where I'm going to feel, well, I kind of know that, or I feel comfortable with that, or that story sounds familiar to me. Um, as, as some of the listeners might know, I'm a big uh, proponent of new works and new voices and uh, being able for those new works and those new voices to be able to have a, a, a gestation home and a creative space to manifest into a production. My thought, you know, for 2021 is that it might not be the time to do a new work uh, that really requires an audience, requires a group of people more than 15 to be able to experience something. So, you know, in the job of finding out what those titles and what those options could be, maintaining a paramount decision in safety, that's that's going to be the exciting challenge for 2021. Theatre Calgary will keep its doors open. We will be producing next year. Uh, how and when is another question, but it is definitely uh, both Maya and I and the company feel very strongly that we want to keep keep going and and also keep uh, this whole digital environment part of that experience as well. I, I thank you for that insight because I think there's a lot of people that Although we think, geez, that company must really have a tough time getting through this pandemic. We're not reaching into the brain of the leadership of those companies going, what are all the bazillion things you have to think about? Um, so n not just like I can't, you know, maybe I can't do a show for 700 only for 70 and I can't do a show of seven people only with one. And, you know, like the thought that has to go into what you're going to do next year is um, too hard for my brain. So I'm glad I'm not having to do it. However, I have written this beautiful one person show called Chickens and Piglets in my backyard. So I, I think, you know, if you do decide that you're going to go ahead with some new work. Hi, yeah. Uh, Griffin Cork here, a literary manager for Theatre Calgary, not even close to actually the truth. Uh, listen, Karen, could you describe the plot of Chickens and Piglets, please? Y yeah, you know, it's about a guy who's got a bad attitude and then these three piglets come and talk to him and, and you know, piglets shows him like what it, he used to be like and then another piglet shows him what he's like right now and then this other piglet shows him what he could be like in the future and then he changes his whole attitude and there's snow I, I really I really didn't appreciate the comedy of that till about halfway through I, I was really <laughs> into I that really clicked for me late in the game I think it's a great idea my biggest question though is are the piglets equity yes but we don't need Ayatsi because we need animal handlers and they don't have to never mind i want to say something quick <laughs> that's such a good question yeah yeah you go ahead smooth transition in my family uh, we celebrate a tradition for the last 24 years of no money christmas all the gifts that you give in our family have to be completely free and then in lieu of giving gifts you give money to the charity of your choice and when griffin was about six just after we had seen uh, Nikki Loach's production of Christmas Carol at Theatre Calgary. Our Christmas present to my family was that Griffin and I acted out the story of a Christmas Carol. What? Oh, see, this is why I'm telling you this because I bet you forgot. Oh, it was me sitting in the living room going, rah, 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 and looking really grumpy. And then you walked in from the hallway and you went, oh, like you were a ghost. And then I looked at you and then I went, oh, <laughs> and I was happy. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, this is this is the kind of innovative stories that we need now in the new pandemic. <laughs> well, what uh, what I actually love about all of what you're sharing, taking Griffin to uh, a Christmas carol at the, you know, young at the age of six uh, and then that production inspiring Griffin to maybe think of, is that something I'd like to do? And then doing a little Christmas pageant at home. That for me is really what makes what we do so, so I guess important, and I don't know if important is the right word or not, but if one person, I've always said this, if one person comes to the theater and is moved, touched and inspired by something that we collectively have done, then we've done our job that it doesn't matter anything else and if so if everyone comes to a christmas carol 700 people and only one person um a little friend named griffin goes mommy that's what i'd like to do then we, then we've done our job and that that oh, 
So Did that makes ever? me very, just very happy to know, not that our, you know, that, that a theater production inevitably inspired Griffin to an extraordinary journey and career and allowed all of his great talents to kind of just be, um, you know, materialized as into the adult that he is today. So yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, hi, Gr- Griffin Cork, um, uh, youngest six year old producer uh, to put on a Christmas pageant here. Um, my question is, oh, wait, you... because I think the number one question that our listeners have right now is what about Toonies for Turkeys? Oh. Is that still part of your production? Can we still support Calgary Food Bank by sticking a toonie into the slot on our computer? <laughs> two bitcoins. You you can actually uh, put a two bitcoin and you could put a thousand dollars if you have uh, that uh, amount uh, of credit on your visa. So yes, <laughs> that is once again a tradition that both Stephen and I and the Calgary Food Bank I uh, had discussions about how do we do this and it's it is happening and it's happening very much how it does in the stage production which is uh following the show there will be a uh, a sharing of of an outreach from Stephen Hare to the community so yes you know when you think about also what's happening in our world and probably the need of of Calgarians uh, more so this year, maybe than any other year. We just had to make that happen. So it is part of, once again, A Christmas Carol. This is another quick little story, another tradition with Griffin and I, is that when we started going to the show and Stephen would do his post-show chat and he'd get to the part about Toonies, halfway through his speech, you could hear coins start rustling in the audience. You could hear people dipping into their change purses. And for Griffin and I, that became... what we thought of as the ultimate sound of Christmas was the sound of coins in the Theatre Calgary Theatre after Stephen Hare had told us about the food bank. So when everybody started getting all generous and giving $10 bills, boy, we had to listen hard for those coins. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cold hard cash anymore. I'm, carrying, I'm the toy magnet. <laughs> Uh, so the only question I would have is, is yeah, you, you guys are all wrapped. It's all in the can. It's all done, as, as film folks say. Where and when will people be able to check it out? Where do they go? When can they go there? Well, the uh, opening night of, the, uh, of this production will be on December the 11th. And uh, if you're interested in uh, finding more information about how to get the, uh, the digital link, uh, you can go to our website, theatercalgary.com, and... Uh, and buy your your ticket there, and be able to get uh, some more information about uh, the cast and all of that great stuff. So, yes, yeah, so we are now moving into the editing bay, uh, where oh, you know, for I guess the next two and a half weeks, we'll be able to take all of this incredible footage, uh, this kind of mosaic of gems, and uh, put them together. We were in the theater for seventy two hours, three days, to uh, capture. Uh, the film and uh and now we have a uh, you know a couple of weeks and a bit to uh piece it all together that's very impressive to film it all in three days and then to edit it in two weeks that's not nothing no it's funny because aaron actually at one point said to me you know we're we're basically filming a movie in three days it, it was truly a herculean effort on everybody's part and uh We came together, you know, uh, maintaining our social distance in the theater, maintaining uh, all of the kind of, you know, safe art requirements that were uh, part of the process. And uh, I'm very excited to be able to share the work and to share Christmas Carol in this format uh, come December 11th. It's $25 per household to watch this show, which is brilliant and reasonable and wonderful and once you have purchased that digital link it's a five days that you have to watch the show as many times as you want over those five days and going to the website and looking for that link there's a brilliant frequently asked questions section there's a lot of digital instructions on how to download it and I believe tell me if I'm right about this Stafford you can gift a viewing of it to somebody else right Absolutely. That's the great thing. You can uh, gift uh, the uh, digital voucher or the digital link to someone. Uh, And again, I think what's great about uh, this uh, offering is, uh, as you just said, $25 uh, is not per person who watches it. If you have a family of four, 
uh, and uh, perhaps on Christmas Day you 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 ex uh, you know extend your bubble by your grandparents or something. Uh, all six friends can watch the show for twenty five dollars. So we wanted to make it as accessible uh, as possible for uh, for our communities, not just again here but around the world. Well, I'm going to download the digital link, Griffin, and you're going to come over and. Um... You're going to come to watch it, but John Paul Fishbach will be sitting in our seats, so we'll have to watch it somewhere else. Yes, I was going to say, we're not podcast hosts anymore, at least I'm not, so we'll definitely have to explore what our new relationship is, whatever that may be. <laughs> uh, we are coming close to the end of our episode, so I just have to jump in here quickly and do a quick thank you to our supporters. That would be the Calgary Arts Development Authority, the Rosé Foundation, and the Calgary Foundation. The intro music you just heard and the outro music you're about to hear is by Alexandra Kalman, and all graphic design for The Breakfast Dish has been done by Morgan Armter. Stafford, thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Breakfast Dish. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, it warms my heart to see the two of you uh, bringing to life something so... Um, one, you know, it connects us all on on a really exciting way, and especially with uh, podcasts. Again, anyone and everyone from around the world can experience this and listen to all of this great uh, banter and insight into uh, our community. So, thank you both. I mean, podcast, but also breakfast, I think, is a nice universal bringing together thing. And on that topic, the way that we like to end episodes usually is Karen will ask you an improvised breakfast-themed question right here. And she'll make it up because she is a professional improviser. Here we go. Three, two, one. If Scrooge was making breakfast for Tiny Tim once they've become friends, what would he be making him? <laughs> Bangers and gruel. Nice. <laughs> The rich and the poor. <laughs> uh, Karen, what else is going on this week? You know what else is happening this week, Griffin, is that there's other theater companies that are wondering how they can do the brilliant pivot that Theater Calgary has done in finding a way to build what Stafford called a fusion between theater and film and offer audiences a way to enjoy their work. So in order to facilitate that happening... I'm going to tell you about some companies in town, some local film companies that are available and helping theater companies do this. Day One Media, which is dayone-media.com. 4K Film Productions, which is the number 4, K filmproductions.com. That's the company that helped Theater Calgary with Christmas Carol. Numera Films, N U M E R A Films.com, Numera Films, Community Productions.ca, Community Productions.ca, and finally Full Swing Productions.com, Full Swing Productions.com. So check them out. Oh, it really has been a joy, Stafford. A true, true joy. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you, friends. Bop, bop, bop. This has been The Breakfast Dish.